All right, so welcome to Grace Baptist Church Adult Sunday School, uh, both of you and anybody who may watch this later. Uh, I want to give thanks to uh, Tyler who filled in for me last week. I appreciate his lesson on interpreting Old Testament narratives. That was a, it was a, a blessing and uh, I found that encouraging and helpful. So thank you, Tyler, for, for filling in for me last week. Let's go ahead and start. I will um, jump right into the lesson. Uh, and let's start off with uh, our PowerPoint. We are in uh, week nine, which is the gospel according to, to Mark. And we are doing uh, the historical background portion. So week nine, the gospel according to Mark, the historical background section. So just by way of general introduction, <clears throat> if you wanted to know what the theme of the gospel of Mark is, it might be something like this. Jesus, the mighty Messiah and son of God, obediently suffers as the servant of the Lord to pay the ransom price for sins and as a model of suffering and sacrifice for his disciples to, to follow. Jesus, the mighty Messiah and son of God, obediently suffers as the servant of the Lord to pay the ransom price for sins and as a model of suffering and sacrifice for his disciples to follow. So we see in this, uh, this theme statement, the fact that the gospel of Mark is concerned with Jesus, the mighty Messiah. We see this in his uh, various miracles and, and, and works. Uh, and how he obediently suffers. So we see the emphasis on the passion that, that takes up the second part of the Gospel of Mark. And we see that that suffering uh, was not uh, for no reason, but yet it was to pay the ransom price for sins and to be a model of suffering and sacrifice for his disciples to follow. So there we see Christ's atonement and its salvation that it procures for us. And then uh, likewise, the fact that it also serves as a model for the Christian life. And that's uh, at least one expression of the theme of the Gospel of Mark. And if you were looking for a key verse that sums some of these ideas up, you might go to Mark 10, 45. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And of course, this is found in a section where he's exhorting the disciples that the way of, uh, of following Jesus is to serve others. So Jesus's uh, death is a ransom and serves as a model uh, for selfless service to others. So maybe I'll ask you, Mr. David or Lois, if she's on, uh, do you guys have favorite verses from Mark? You're muted, by the way. There you go. Uh, uh, actually, no. No, no favorite verses from Mark. Lois, do you have a favorite verse from Mark? Um, let's see. Is it probably a mark somewhere um where he this said he said that the son of man did not come to be served but to serve that's right yeah that's right so yeah so that's one of that's one of my favorite verses as well <laughs> right there there it is there you go <laughs> tell us how much i've been paying attention here <laughs> well I, I i already mentioned that there's a lot going on in our house right now so um yeah so interestingly Probably very few people, I'm guessing, is the Gospel of Mark their favorite gospel. So it's just really, you know, a lot of people love Matthew. It's got the Great Commission. It's got you are Peter and upon this rock I'll build my church. It's got the, the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, it's just uh, just such a it's got so much teaching from Jesus. A lot of people love Luke, the emphasis on Jesus as the, you know, the one who cares for the lowly, the downcast, you know, people who the world uh, doesn't, doesn't consider much of. Gospel of John talks about Jesus's pre-existence, but, you know, Mark is kind of like the, um, you know, the, the one that gets left behind. Not many people love Mark. And actually, that's that's uh, not just that's not just for what we've experienced. That's actually historically the case. Uh, the <clears throat> Mark was the most neglected gospel in the early church. He was basically viewed as the cliff notes of Matthew and Luke. So it's like, well, I've got Matthew and Luke. We don't really need to uh, read Mark. In fact, the um, first commentary on the Gospel of Mark was written after the 600s, I think, or in the 600s. So it really not many pe people paid attention to it. 
Uh, but once in modern times, the idea of mark and priority came came about, all of a sudden mark is, uh, there's been a renaissance in mark studies and it's uh, now one of the gospels that people are doing most, uh, a, a lot of work in, uh, a lot of study and a lot of emphasis on because now it's viewed as the first gospel, the foundational gospel. So it's, uh, that's um, part, of, part of the significance of the book there. And if we wanted to think of a couple of characteristics first, uh, Mark's gospel tells the gospel narrative in its most basic outline. <clears throat> and um, it's interesting that Mark contains the, uh, the least unique material. So if we looked at this chart, and this is from, you can see here, the study, a uh, statistical study of synoptic problem. I haven't, you know, looked at the, um, I haven't looked at that, uh, that study, so I can't speak to it. But this chart seems to represent what's been my experience, which is, which is you've got uh, material that's common to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and that you, that you find 76% of Mark is also found in both Matthew and Luke. Uh, and, you know, you find material that's unique to Mark, only 3% of the material that's in Mark is unique to Mark. Uh, and compare that to material in Luke, 35% of Luke is not found in either of the other two synoptic gospels. And 20% of Matthew is not found in any of the other synoptic gospels, right? So relatively speaking, Mark has the, the least unique material. Um, you know, most of Mark is found in both Matthew uh, and, and, and Luke. And so that leads it to, you know, if, you wanted, if you're thinking about what is distinctive about Mark, it's almost it's non-distinctiveness, which is distinctive. You know, the fact that, um, the fact that uh, Mark seems to give the gospel in its... Uh, in its most basic outline. Uh, if you look at Mark and Luke, uh, you can often see their distinctive focuses by looking at how they weave their unique material into the rest of the gospel. Uh, so, you know, you can see, you know, the various Jewish references in, in, in Matthew. Uh, you can see the emphasis on fulfillment in Matthew. You can see in Luke, the emphasis on the Holy Spirit and prayer, because those things get woven into the, into the material that's common. But Mark is, really, um, you know, uh, really just seems to um, be the, the basic in its basic outline, the gospel. So, so that's one thing about uh, Mark to keep in mind. Also, it's a gospel that, that tells its narrative in vivid detail. Uh, so, for example, if you see the, the story where um, the, the Jesus calms the sea, and, you know, it talks, Matthew and Luke both say that Jesus was asleep, but only Mark says that Jesus was sleeping on a cushion, right? So there's a couple places where you just see these unique details uh, that, 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 that speak to its eyewitness testimony. For example, there, when Jesus tells the, the multitude, he feeds the multitude with the loaves and fishes, and he tells them to, to sit down, and, and, it, and it says in Mark, they sat down on the green grass, uh, you know, just those interesting eyewitness details. It's also a, a vivid gospel. Uh, the gospel of Mark uses the word immediately, the Greek word for immediately 42 times versus uh, Matthew, which uses it five times and one, Luke uses it one time. And the, the you know, there's a, a, a characteristic of the Greek language called the historical present uh, tense. And that's when the present tense is used in a past, uh, past context. And it's often used to create vividness. So I could say something like, the hero grabbed the rope and swung across the pit. Or I could, you know, say it in the present. So you feel like it's really vivid and happening right in front of your eyes. The hero grabs the rope and he swings across the pit, you know, and that's, and, and Mark is filled with that. Mark has uh, 151 uses of the historical present uh, versus 93 uses in Mark and 11 in Luke. So Mark is a very vivid eyewitness account, and that's one of the wonderful things about it. And among the Gospels, it's also interesting to note that Mark goes out of the way, out of his way to present the disciples as dense and lacking understanding. Um, you know, and again, this is to show that Jesus is the true hero of, of the Gospel, and we could give some examples of that. So let's look at the historical background, um, and we're going to focus on this paradigm of author, text, audience, and context, uh, like we did with Matthew. And uh, just, to be, just to be honest, we'll spend most of our time on the author and on the, uh, the text. Uh, 
and we'll just kind of touch on some of the other elements as they come up because honestly we just don't can't reconstruct all of it with real great confidence so in terms of authorship the gospel of mark is anonymous uh, but tradition says that it was written by john mark the associate of peter and paul and this is we find this in the title which is consistent in ascribing it to the gospel uh, the gospel to to mark we also find it in church history, which consistently ascribes it to, to Mark. You never find anybody saying, oh, yes, uh, maybe it was written by, you know, somebody else. Uh, church tradition is, uh, is, is consistent in ascribing Mark as the author of the gospel. And while we can't necessarily confirm that, we don't really actually have any reason to deny that. There's nothing that casts any doubt on it. So it seems like a... Um, uh, a reasonable judgment. And we, in fact, we might even ask this question, uh, why would the early church have ascribed authorship to somebody who, number one, wasn't an apostle, number two, wasn't very prominent, and number three, even has a kind of a mixed re record of ministry faithfulness. Think of the fact that Mark left uh, Paul and Barnabas uh, and went back to Jerusalem. So it's like, um, you know, the early church, when uh, when people wanted to kind of come up with an author for some, for a writing and to kind of impress people, they'd always say, oh, this is Peter's, this is the gospel of Peter, you know, or this is the gospel of Thomas. Uh, but, you know, John Mark, you just can't think of a good reason why someone would make that up. So it seems like a good judgment to hold on to. The other interesting thing about uh, the gospel of Mark is that, uh, is that the church tradition consistently says that the gospel of Mark is uh, dependent on the the preaching of Peter, uh, that it's dependent on the preaching of Peter. Uh, for example, um, the church father Papias, who is a disciple of the apostle John, uh, is quoted in Eusebius as saying as saying this. This also the presbyter John, that is John, the apostle John said, Mark, having become the interpreter of Peter, wrote down accurately, though not in order, whatever he remembered of the things said or done by Christ. For he neither heard the Lord nor followed him, but afterwards, as I said, he followed Peter, who adapted his teaching to the needs of his hearers, but with no intention of giving us a connected account of the Lord's discourses, so that Mark committed no error when he thus wrote some things he as he remembered them, for he was careful of one thing, not to admit any of the things which he had heard, not to say, state any of them falsely. Uh, these things are related by Papias concerning Mark. Uh, so this is very, very early first century tradition is that, uh, is that Mark was written uh, based on uh, the preaching of Peter. And we see this also, there's, a, there's a, a prologue to the old Latin text in the second century. You know, it's kind of like the study Bibles. You have your who, what, when, where, how, and why printed right at the top of the, you know, your actual scriptural text. And here's what the old Latin prologue uh, to Mark says. It says, Mark, who was also called stub finger because he had short fingers with regard to the other dimensions of his body. He had been the disciple and recorder or interpreter of Peter, whom he followed just as he had heard him relating. Having been asked by the brethren in Rome, he wrote this short gospel in the regions of Italy. When Peter heard about it, he approved and authorized it to be read to the church with his own authority. Continues. Uh, but after the demise or maybe departure, depending on how you translate it, uh, of Peter taking this gospel that he had composed, he journeyed to Egypt and being ordained the first bishop of Alexandria, he founded the church there, preaching Christ. He was a man of such great learning and austerity of life that he induced all the followers of Christ to imitate his example. Um, so again, this is there's this really consistent tradition among the church fathers that the gospel of Mark was written based on the preaching of Peter. And um, while there's some, there's some, you know, discrepancies in terms of the, 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 the details of it, you know, was it written while Peter was alive? Was it written after Peter died? Um, the, the, the tradition of it being dependent on, on Peter's preaching is, is very consistent. Uh, interestingly, the, um, you know, uh, Mark was, uh, as you can see in this passage here, uh, said to have gone down to Alexandria and started the church in Egypt. And if you ever read anything by the uh, Coptic Orthodox Church there, Peter, uh, Mark is a extremely important figure in their, you know, kind of reckoning of their, um, the, their church's origin. So, um, now, tradition says, 
speaks to, to the question of, uh, you know, Mark's dependence on Peter, but, uh, you know, we can see this even in scripture, there's, uh, there's some warrant for um, maybe not drawing that conclusion, but maybe evidence that's consistent of it, with it. Uh, for example, in 1 Peter 5, 13, maybe written 62, 63 AD, something like that, uh, we see uh, Peter mentioning that he's in Rome, she who is in Babylon uh, sends greetings, that is probably the church at Rome, uh, and does my son Mark. So we see in the, in the early 60s, Mark uh, accompanying Peter in Rome. Um, we could also read, for example, uh, uh, some of the preaching of Peter, and we can see a very similar, um, a very similar uh, character to it as, as maybe what you find in Mark. I'm thinking maybe about specifically verse 38. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who are oppressed by the devil, for God was with him, and, uh, and, so, and so forth. So, Again, uh, biblical evidence that it doesn't doesn't show that that Mark was dependent upon Peter, but it might be consistent with it. So we can read that, but for the sake of time, we'll just keep moving. Um, there's also this interesting, a couple interesting places in Mark where it, where um, it says that Peter remembered something. Uh, that's interesting. So here at the cursing of the fig tree, notice in Matthew 21, 20, when the disciples saw it, they were amazed saying, how did the fig tree wither so quickly? But then when we go over to uh, Mark, it says, uh, Peter remembered and said, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. So there's this very interesting uh, note in Mark about Peter remembering something. Similarly with the uh, Peter's denial uh, of Christ at the, in, the, in the passion uh, sequence, you, you have it saying, Peter remembered that Jesus had predicted this. And you know, it might be indicative of, uh, of Peter's perspective in, in the gospel. So we have the gospel uh, according to Mark as the as the preaching of Peter. Maybe I'll just mention make, um, I'll just mention an intriguing idea that I've come across in my study that I just uh, again I don't know if I can I don't know if you could necessarily prove it but it just is um, curious to me and it's this idea. So we've already talked about you know the idea that Mark was written first and the the, uh, the other synoptic gospels are, are using Mark to some degree. And as I mentioned, that's uh, not universally held, but it's a uh, it's um, a lot of people find it compelling, and I, I find it in many in many uh, passages it seems to best explain the data. Uh, but if Mark's gospel is written first and depends on Peter, it would be an interesting interesting that it's consistent with uh, Scripture's portrait of Peter as the foundational apostle, right? Think of Matthew sixteen eighteen: You are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Um, again, not as the uh, first pope, but, you know, the first confessor uh, and an early leader in the church. Think of Peter as the one preaching the Acts 2 sermon, you know, where on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit comes down and the church is born as people are repent and put their faith in Christ for salvation, are baptized, incorporated into church. Think of Peter as the one who is uh, first preaches to the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10. Uh, and it would just be an intriguing idea to me that if the first gospel was also dependent upon Peter, uh, and maybe just to take that one step further, if Matthew and Luke are these variations on Peter's perspective, you know, kind of adaptations of Peter's perspective, uh, and then we have John's gospel from uh, a completely different perspective, um, you know, or, or a, or a complementary perspective, it would be interesting to me that uh, that those two foundational perspectives, that of Peter and John, uh, are two of the three of Jesus's inner circle that you see in the gospel. All, you always find, of course, Jesus, the 12, but then the inner circle, Peter, James, and, and John. And James is killed by Herod and, you know, in the book of Acts, it records that. But it would just be curious to me if the foundational gospel perspectives were those of Peter's and, and John's. Um, wouldn't make, uh, wouldn't make um, Matthew or Luke any less inspired or less authoritative, but it would be an interesting way to think of the inner logic of the gospels anyway. So there you go, just an intriguing idea to, you know, to think about, uh, if you will. So let's just look uh, for a couple of minutes at uh, what scripture has to say about John Mark. First of all, we see that John Mark's family was, uh, at least his mother was, um, uh, early, a very important, or uh, at the center of the, the Christian 
uh, church in, in Jerusalem. It says uh, this is when Peter was released from prison and before he uh, goes off to escape. Uh, it says uh, that he, he realizes he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. And you remember this story. This is where Peter knocks on the door and servant girl thinks it's his ghost and runs off and doesn't let him in, right? Uh, so here we see the early church is meeting at, at, at the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark. So John Mark is, is growing up in the context of this uh, uh, Christian movement. And in fact, we see him accompanying Paul and Barnabas on the first missionary trip. So Acts chapter 13, uh, Paul and Barnabas went down Seleucia, sailed to Cyprus, etc. And they had John as their helper. But then we see in verse 13 uh, that John leaves them and returns to Jerusalem. And of course, you're familiar with the fact this ends up in Acts 15, causing a, a schism between Paul and Barnabas, because Paul wants to go back and uh, visit the churches and see how they're doing. Verse 37, Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with him also, but Paul kept insisting they shouldn't take him along who had deserted them. Um, and there was such a sharp disagreement that they separated. Barnabas took Mark and sailed away to Cyprus. Uh, we... Then we move forward, though, and we get to the Pauline epistles, and we see that there's some kind of reconciliation happens. Here in Philemon, it says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Jesus or Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow worker. So Mark is being recognized later as Paul's fellow worker. Uh, same thing in Colossians 4.10 is Paul sends greetings from Barnabas' cousin Mark. Um, Finally, in 2 Timothy, Paul tells Timothy to pick up Mark and bring him with you for he's useful to me for service. So we see that despite the, you know, the fact that um, Paul it, at one point doesn't want to take him along, uh, he ends up uh, being viewed by Paul as a useful fellow worker. And then, of course, we also touched on 1 Peter 5, 13, where, where we see Mark as an associate of Peter as well. <clears throat> You know, when he sends greetings from uh, whom, the one he calls my son, Mark. Um, so, so scripture talks about Mark and his, uh, you know, his involvement in the early Christian mission and the life of the church. And maybe I'll just raise one more passage that is, again, uh, hard to prove anything but intriguing. And it's um, this passage here in the Gospel of Mark, when, when Jesus is arrested uh, and, you know, in verse 50, they all, that is the disciples, leave him and flee from in the Garden of Gethsemane. And you see the statement, verse 51, 52, a young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body, and they seized him, but he pulled free the linen sheet and escaped naked. And this is one of those strange verses that kind of comes out of nowhere, and you say, why is that verse there? I mean, he's not one of the disciples, uh, it's just kind of comes from nowhere and leads to nowhere. And scholars have, has said, is this, uh, is this a picture of the, is this a picture of the author? Is this, uh, you know, kind of like we had in Matthew, uh, where, where Matthew, Jesus has this parable of the scribe, who's like uh, a faithful householder that brings things old and new. And we asked the question is, could that be Matthew's impression of his task as he's the one bringing out of the old Testament and the revelation in Christ um, you know, he's the, the scribe uh, discipled into the kingdom of heaven. And is this, you know, a picture of, uh, uh, of uh, John Mark's uh, presence in the gospel? Of course, we'll never know. Can't, can't really ever prove that, but it's just kind of an intriguing idea in light of the fact that we don't really have any reason why the, any, any, idea, any clue to the significance of the passage otherwise. So, so that's the authorship. We, we believe that it was written by John Mark under the uh, influence of uh, Peter. Uh, we'll look at the audience. And first of all, we'll just uh, remember the fact that we're here looking in Gospels as at typical first readers, uh, maybe what you might call a target audience, not specific first readers. And we talked about that in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, that is unlike uh, the epistles where you have Paul writing to specific people with specific, uh, you know, questions in mind. Um, the Gospels seem to be more, uh, more like, you know, maybe you think of a newspaper article, you know, think of an editorial in, in a newspaper. Somebody writes an editorial. It's kind of out there for everybody to read. Uh, of course, you know, they're going to have certain people in mind. They're going to have people that, the kind of people that read newspapers, 
the kind of people that belong to you know our culture and are you know um, familiar with the background ideas that he's talking about. But you know, a newspaper editorial is not really looking, not really targeted at specific people. It's more more the idea of a target audience, and so I think that's what we have here in the in the Gospels as well, as I mentioned in Matthew. First, we have what's probably a non-Jewish audience. Um, for example, uh, Mark's Gospel includes these Aramaic phrases that are translated. So think of uh, Mark three seventeen, where he talks about. James and his brother John, the sons of Zebedee, that Jesus gives the name Boanerges, which is sons of thunder, right? So he, he gives the Aramaic term, but then he translates it because he doesn't think that his audience can read Aramaic. Uh, another example, uh, when Jesus raises the girl from the dead, uh, Mark 5, 41, then gently taking the child by the hand, he says, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. You know, he translates it. And then simply, similarly in Mark 7, uh, Jesus looks up to heaven and says with a sigh, Ephratha, that is, be opened. And the, immediately the man's ears were opened. And Mark's interesting in that he, uh, he incorporates so many, you know, Aramaic terms and then translates them for the audience because he assumes they can't understand them. And similarly, we see explanation of Jewish customs. So in this whole controversy about washing hands in Mark 7, uh, uniquely, Mark is the one in 7.3 where he gives this explanation of the custom of hand washing. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they perform a ritual washing, holding fast to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they don't eat unless they wash. They hold fast to many other traditions, the washing of cups, pots, kettles, dining couches. Uh, it's kind of a curious, uh, a curious um, you know, phrase, but it seems like it's put there because he assumes that, well, you know, in order for the readers to understand this idea of the conflict between Jesus and the leaders, they'd have to understand this idea of ritual washing and they, they might not know what that is. Uh, so he goes ahead and explains it there. So we see it's probably a, a non-Jewish audience is, is the target audience here. Um, it's all, there's also a good chance it's a Roman audience. We talked about the, the traditional ascription uh, of, uh, of Mark's writing this to the church that's in Rome or excuse me, uh, at, at Rome in Italy. Um, but there's also some characteristics. For example, um, there's the use of specific uh, Roman terms or Latin terms for things. Here in um, the, the parable the, the, uh, or the story of the, the, what is it? The widow's might, I think is maybe the King James version. 1242, the poor widow came and put in two small, small, two small copper coins worth less than a penny. Uh, interestingly, Luke has the same story, but he just says they put in two uh, small copper coins. But Mark distinctively says how much those coins are worth, and the uh, the Greek term is uh, quadrantes, which is just a transliteration. It's a it's a Latin loan word uh, for a quadrants, which is a you know Latin Latin term. So it's interesting the inclusion in the Gospel of Mark of these uh, these Latin terms. Uh, another one you find in the in the the story of John the Baptist's beheading, uh, Mark 6, 27 uh, says, so the king sent an executioner and the word for executioner in Greek is a Latin loan word. Uh, as opposed to Matthew 14, verse 10, it says he sent and had John beheaded. So interestingly, this might give us the clue that there's a, you know, a uh, Roman background uh, because of the use of Latin words. Also, interestingly, is this, this, uh, this reference in Mark chapter 15, when Jesus comes out and, and the, the soldiers press Simon of Cyrene to carry his cross, uh, it's, Mark explains, uh, uniquely Mark explains that he, the Simon of Cyrene, is the father of Alexander and Rufus, uh, in, implying that the, the first readers might have known who that was. And then interestingly, whether it's this, you know, maybe this is the same person, Romans chapter 16, Paul says to the people in Rome, greet Rufus, a choice man in the Lord. So, um, of course, I'm sure there's more than one person named Rufus in the ancient world, but, you know, it, there, there's, the, there's the possibility with all the other evidence uh, coming into play that maybe um, this, this is the same person. And that uh, if so, then this is, uh, you know, maybe evidence that it was written in Rome. So... We talked about how it's 
at least a non-Jewish audience and a Roman audience. But then finally, that, you know, it's a book for all Christians. We can read it today with spiritual benefit. It has lots of universal application and uh, was probably written uh, with the intention that people anywhere would be able to read it and, you know, learn about the Messiah. So that's the, that's the audience. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the context uh, in terms of circumstances. Honestly, we don't really, don't really know. There's, it's hard to trace down, um, you know, it's hard to trace down the uh, uh, circumstances that might lie behind this. Uh, because of the gospel's somewhat general character, we might speculate, is it, you know, was it written because of uh, the desire to preserve Peter's teaching in light of what we've said about the early church's tradition? Uh, lots of scholars also talk about the fact that it may have been written uh, to encourage the church around uh, the time of Nero's persecution in the 60s. So, and they'll point to passages like uh, Mark 8, where it says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Uh, you know, saying that, well, maybe this was written in order to help people to follow Jesus in the middle of persecution. And that may be, but of course, it's really hard to nail it down that for specifically. So in my mind, we'll just leave it as a somewhat general, um, you know, a general gospel written to encourage people to follow Jesus and to preach the gospel as the church expanded throughout the, the uh, early world. Um, or early for or the first century world there. So in terms of purposes, when I take into account the evidence from tradition and evidence from the document itself, uh, I, I think three purposes stand out. First of all, you know, as I said, from tradition, a historical purpose to preserve Peter's apostolic preaching of Christ. Uh, people wanted to hear what Peter had to say and Mark uh, wrote that down so they would have Peter's authoritative perspective. Uh, secondly, a Christological purpose to present Jesus as the suffering son of God. They were preaching the gospel, right? They were uh, writing the story of Jesus, the Messiah, how he fulfilled the scriptures, how he uh, did mighty, wondrous, miraculous works, how he suffered and died to redeem us from our sins and, uh, and so forth. And then thirdly, a discipleship purpose to show that show people how to follow Jesus in the upside down kingdom of God. And this becomes clear, especially in the second half of the book where Jesus teaches them about his own uh, impending crucifixion and invites them to follow him in, in, uh, in denying themselves and um, taking up their own cross. Interestingly, when we compare Mark to Matthew, Matthew is much, much more ecclesial than, than Mark is. Think of the passage where it talks about, um, you know, uh, you are Peter upon this rock, I will build my church. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Uh, Matthew's gospel me explicitly mentions the, the word the church, you know, twice. You have the section on church discipline. You have the great commission. Uh, so Matthew's gospel is much more ecclesial, whereas it seems that uh, Mark's gospel is more oriented towards the idea of discipleship, of following Jesus. Uh, and of course, there's, you know, ecclesial ramifications of that. You know, we follow Jesus, not just as individuals, but as the church. But he's, uh, uh, Mark seems less concerned with the, um, you know, uh, maybe what we might call the institutional facets of, uh, of discipleships, discipleship. So we've already talked about the place of writing is probably in Rome, according to, to tradition. And you know, I'll just suggest the date of in the 50s and 60s as the uh, as the origin, and this comes comes from the idea that we think through the question of the synoptic problem. If you know Luke and Acts was written after after the 60s, uh, excuse me, after 62 sometime, and you know if Luke was using Mark, then that pushes Mark back to you know 50s uh, maybe, uh, or we might ask the question of when Peter was in Rome. Uh, and based on First Peter, we might pause it maybe 62, 63. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, I, I don't feel really confident in any of those. And if you read New Testament introductions, a lot of times they won't be very specific either. So probably just a date in the 50s or 60s gets us close enough uh, for our purposes now. So with that, let's transition to talking briefly about the ending of Mark.
um, because that's a, a significant issue uh, for Mark's gospel. And um, uh, so I'm going to turn over to Mark chapter 16 now and take a look at that. Uh, so the ending of Mark is one of the most significant text critical uh, issues in the New Testament. Uh, probably that and the pericope of the adulteress in John chapter 7, 53 through 8, 11, um, because it's such a large passage and there's uh, a lot of controversy surrounding it. And more or less what the issue is, it, and if we had um, a little more time, we would just go ahead and read through Mark 16. Um, but the, what the issue is, is that Mark 16, especially verses 19 through 20, it's early and widespread, but it's missing from some uh, early and important manuscripts. It's missing from early and important manuscripts. Um, maybe, uh, maybe I'll just ask you if. Uh, well, I won't do this because I don't know if you're with me. If, but I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what my my Bible does is the one I'm looking at has actually has brackets around Mark 16 9 through 20. Uh, it might be interesting for you to take a look sometime at your Bible and see if they mark it. Mine has brackets and a little footnote. Uh, and the footnote says, uh, later manuscripts add verses 19 through 20. So I think, I think today, nowadays, most Bibles are going to have some, unless you have maybe an old King James, most Bibles are going to have some, uh, something marking it, um, uh, telling you that there's, uh, you know, some doubt about whether it's original. So that's the that's the that's the issue and the question of what are the options well if you want to read an in-depth uh study you can read dr black's book uh perspectives on the ending of mark four views and i'll just give you those give you those views now the the, the first one is that the mark verses six excuse, excuse me mark 16 verses 9 through 20 is the originally intended ending uh written by Mark himself, and that's uh, Maurice Robinson defends that view based on a based on a Byzantine priority view, and he gives lots of really good reasons why one might believe that view. Uh, there's also a, a similar view that says that Mark 16 9, 9 through 20 is uh, is is the en intended ending, uh, but that it was a Markan supplement that that uh, Mark um, wrote the gospel up to verse 16 verse 8. But then uh, a little bit later, added verses 9 through 20, and that's why they're, they're a little bit different and missing in some manuscripts. And this is uh, defended by my, my doctoral supervisor, David Allen Black. Uh, then you've got the view that the Gospel of Mark actually was intended to end at Mark 16, 8. <clears throat> that's defended by Dan Wallace, and I think that's a very popular view amongst evangelicals. It's just that's that's where the gospel ended and the rest is a later edition. And then you have the view that uh, Mark Mark event originally had a longer ending, but that somehow that was lost to us. Uh, it was maybe damaged. The original manuscript was damaged. And so all we it was basically cut off at the end. And um, and so we've lost the ending. We just don't have it. Uh, and that, that's defended by Keith Elliott, and that's, you know, academics, a lot of academics hold that view. Uh, you know, from my perspective, that, that view could be possible, um, because God, is, God gives us his scripture through all kinds of historical circumstances, and one of those things could be, um, you know, the loss of, of, of an ending, um, you know, but nevertheless, I think my, my inclination is to take uh, Mark 16, 8 as the originally intended ending. And this is a huge topic, and we could spend a, a really long time on it. But what I'd like to do, and since we've only got 10 more minutes, is I'd like to just give you a couple of reasons why I hold the view that the Gospel of Mark uh, ends at 16, 8. And I'm seeing David Abbott raising his hand. So, David, you got a question? Uh, yeah, just a, a quick clarification on that last view. Is it like that the uh, Gospel of Mark ended at verse eight, and the subsequent subsequent verses were just sort of added in as sort of a um, like this is what we remember from memory? Or oh what? yeah, you mean the one where the ending's lost? Yeah, the ending. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that view is that the um, is that there was just another ending 
and you know it got ripped off and everybody was everybody was concerned about it so we provided an alternate ending but we really have no idea the 9 through 20 are not original uh, and we'll probably never we'll probably never find the original the, the original ending okay. yeah and again that there's probably a, more of an evangelical version of that and a non-evangelical version you know so for non-evangelicals you know uh, the question of inspiration isn't a big deal so yeah Lots of works. You lose lots of works. We've got lots of works from antiquity that we just don't have anymore. And, you know, that's how it goes. Uh, for an evangelical who believes it's God's word, you know, that would have to be incorporated into, you know, some question of canonicity is that, 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 the, that the loss of the ending would be part of God's providential arrangement of his message, you know, something like that, I think. But again, that's not my view. I, uh, I'm, all I'm saying is that, is that I don't think it, it's, inherently anti-evangelical i just think um i think the better ending is the that of use it if it ends at, cha at chapter 16 verse 8 so let me give you a couple quick reasons why i hold this view number one um it is true and needs to be acknowledged that the longer ending is early and widespread okay that's you have to say that up front it's because there's a lot of good reasons why someone might hold that to be original uh and here's what i have in in mind when i say that number one um we have even as early as uh, the church father Irenaeus writing in about 180, so second century, he, he writes this. It says, also toward the conclusion of his gospel, Mark says, so then after the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sits on the right hand of God. And when you look at Mark chapter 16, verse 19, it says, so then when the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was received up to heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. So, I mean, here's Arianus. He says it was Mark's gospel. He quotes from Matthew or Mark 16, 19, and it seems to be a good match. So, I mean, this ending is around in the second century. Um, and, you know, as someone who doesn't hold it to be original, I, I, it's important to, though, to acknowledge that, you know, it's not, it, it's, a diff, it's a difficult decision and people can hold the opposite view for good reasons. And just a martyr, has a similar quote writing in the second century that seems to be from Mark, uh, Mark 16, 20, uh, word, from wor word for word. It says, his apostles having gone out, preached everywhere, is what Justin Martyr says. Then you read Mark 16, 20, it says, they went out and preached everywhere. And basically is word for word, uh, you know, contains the, uh, you know, something from the ending of Mark. So it's very, very early. Uh, and, I, and I want to acknowledge that. And also, I should say that the, the majority of manuscripts that we have of Mark contain that, the, the ending, the longer ending. Okay. Nevertheless, <clears throat> the shorter ending is found in, in two very early and important manuscripts. So this would be uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Um, and uh, these are the, the earliest Greek manuscript witnesses that we have to this passage. So... The, the earliest actual texts we have of Mark's gospel end at chapter 16, 8. And these are, these are important manuscripts because textual critics, uh, many textual critics view these as, as very, very trustworthy and reliable manuscripts. Um, this is from, uh, this is from uh, I think this is Vaticanus. Let me just double check here. Yeah, this is Vaticanus. This is fourth century. So in the 300s, here I'm showing you the ending of it. And, you know, Ephabun, Ta gar, you know, for they were afraid, ends in, in chapter six, uh, 16, verse eight. And it doesn't look, you know, the manuscript's not damaged. It's not, you know, that for, from all we can tell by looking at that manuscript, that was the ending that they had available to them. <clears throat> and that's in the 300s. So, so that's, you know, that's something worth significant. Uh, granted, it's, it's only two manuscripts, but they're, but they're important ones. Um, and, and even that, though, would not be necessarily be sufficient on its own. Let me give you some additional reasons why, um, uh, why uh, uh, it seems like the Mark's gospel ends at 16.8. Um, there's a number of assorted evidence, and let me give you a couple of these things. First of all, there's an alternate ending. Um, I've got the NASB, and they actually print this at, after, the, uh, after uh, 16 verse 20. Uh, and it says, and they promptly reported all these instructions to Peter and his companions. After that, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. 
So this is an alternate ending uh, two verses nine through 20. Uh, this is found in, uh, in some manuscripts in place of verses 9 through 20. So you don't have the longer ending, but instead you have this shorter ending that seems to kind of like put a cap on the, on the gospel. And you also have a number, of uh, a number of witnesses where you get both of these. Uh, you know, at, in other words, they weren't really sure. So they just left them both there, um, you know, as, as alternate endings. And... Uh, and the fact that you have another alternate ending supplied means that there's other, you know, other people are reading a gospel without an ending and feeling like there needs to be something more to it. Okay, so the alternate ending is uh, is another piece of advice, or excuse me, another piece of evidence. And I'm going to talk to you real briefly about the Eusebian canons, the testimony of the fathers, and some marginal notes. Okay, <clears throat> first of all, the Eusebian canons. These go in the ancient manuscripts, roughly where your maps go in your Bible. They're at the front, and they line up all the gospel pericopes, the paragraphs, so you can see where each one is found in, you know, all four gospels, or in three gospels, or in two gospels, or in just in one gospel. And the Eusebian canons, which date, you know, which date back to the third century, uh, don't contain anything past Mark 16:8, right? So. Uh, so whoever designed this system of correlating the, the paragraphs in the gospel didn't have the ending of the gospel in front of them when they did that. Um, also, the testimony of the fathers. Here's Eusebius in the fourth century. He's dealing with the question of harmonizing the resurrection accounts in Matthew and Mark. And he says, well, you might answer this way. Uh, the, the paragraph that says this, the pericope that says this, you might say that it's not actually in all the copies of the gospel according to the Mark. The accurate ones of the copies, at least, circumscribe the end of the history according to Mark in the words of the young man seen by the women. Uh, and it ends with, for they were afraid. So he says the accurate co copies of Mark end with, for they were afraid. He goes on to say, for in this manner, the ending of the gospel according to Mark is circumscribed in almost all the copies. Isn't that interesting? So while we only have two manuscripts, uh, that ended in 16.8. He says, uh, you know, that the ending of the Gospel of Mark ends at 16.8 in almost all the copies, at least the accurate ones. So now he is dealing with questions of harmonization, you know, and so he says, this is one way that you might deal with, uh, you know, problems of harmonization. You might just say that the ending isn't actually original and that the accurate manuscripts don't have that ending, okay? But nevertheless, Eusebius, and this is picked up by other church fathers, uh, is aware of the fact that uh, that many good manuscripts of Mark do not have the ending in it. Okay, so we've got the Eusebian canons, we've got the testimony of the fathers, and then you get these interesting marginal notes. And whether the gospel contains the longer or the short en shorter ending, these these manuscripts have these little notes by the by the scribes that say something like this: In some of the copies, the evangelist finishes here. Up to which point also Eusebius of Pamphilius made canon sections, but in many, the following is also contained, right? So, and there's these various, there's these various notes. If we had more time and if we were taking a Greek class, I'd walk you through some of them because they're absolutely you know fascinating. But you know, even 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 manuscripts that contain the ending uh, nine through twenty had these little notes saying, um, you know, that there the scribes are aware of other copies where they don't have that ending. Okay, so uh, we've got the alternate ending and assorted manuscript evidence. I see we're basically about out of time. I've got just a point or two more. Um, there's, you know, evidence based on style and content of the ending. So people that study Greek say it doesn't read like the rest of the Greek or the rest of the gospel. Of course, other people dis disagree with that. But, you know, it's interesting that the ending seems to be a mashup of these other of these other gospels. And when you read it, you say, oh, I feel like I read that somewhere before. For example, the part where it says, after that, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking along their way to the country, right? Sounds like the road to Emmaus. It's, um, you know, if you read through these, you go, oh, you know, they'll, they'll uh, speak in other languages. You're like, oh, that's Acts, isn't that? So, you know, it seems to have this imagery from other gospels. It seems to be like a mashup of resurrection appearances, which you find elsewhere. Um, and um, and maybe maybe I'll just say it, it's easier to explain a scribe adding it than it is to explain a scribe leaving it off.
you say, why would a scribe leave off the ending? I mean, it could have been an accident, um, you know, but it'd be hard to, hard to think of somebody like deliberately not putting the last 12 verses. On the other hand, you could say, would, can you think of a reason why someone would add it? Yeah, it, it just seems a little, especially when you compare it to the other gospels, it seems to be missing something in terms of, you know, Jesus doesn't actually appear. So those are some reasons why I hold this view. If you want more information, um, there's, uh, there's lots of articles. I've put some links on my blog underneath where this recording will go and you can, you know, read up there. And I'm gonna let you go without talking about what it means for the interpretation of Mark just for the sake of time. So guys, thank you so much for your, your diligence. Sorry, it was uh, a little rushed today. And uh, Lord willing, we'll see some of you in a, in a little bit.